So I just finished watching the Halloween spooktacular episode of WandaVision. We're now two thirds of the way through this season. That means next week we start moving into the third act, but we're not quite there yet. So let's stop and talk about everything we learned in episode six. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Let me know what did you think about this week's episode of WandaVision and what did you kind of pick up on? What was the cool things you discovered in this episode? It is a spoiler review. It's in the title, so no need for spoiler warnings. As we go into this, I'll give you my general impressions on the episode and then I'll kind of walk through the episode and talk about the stuff that I figured out. If you want to skip ahead, there are little chapter markers down below and and let's get started with my general impressions. So for me, there was so much good stuff in this episode that I definitely felt like this one needed another five, 10 minutes. Some people have been saying all along that the episodes need to be longer, and I don't think I would agree with that. The first three episodes as just kind of those sitcoms, that was the length that they needed to be. And then episode four was the exposition episode and it had some length to it, but it was just kind of catching us up on what was going on on the outside. Last week's episode is the longest episode thus far and it was like 45 minutes long, but it had the sitcom stuff and it had the outside world stuff. So that kind of made sense. This one dialed back the length about eight minutes from where last week was at. And I think you felt that watching it because it's trying to do the sitcom thing it's trying to show us their family dynamic. In particular, there's some really big stuff with the twins. Then you, of course, have the Wanda and Pietro dynamic kind of going on in there. And you're getting a lot of little nuggets about what's going on with him, what Wanda does and doesn't know. And then you have Vision on his own little side quest. And then, of course, you have the outside world. That's a lot of plot for under 40 minutes, especially when your show's end credits are like 20 minutes long. I don't know if you've ever sat down for the end credits on this show, but it is long. So I, as soon as we got to the end, I was like, oh, I bet this is the end right here. This is it. And you, you feel like you want more. And some of that's good. Like you want to end the show and be like, man, I can't wait till we, we get to figure out what else is kind of going on here. And in another sense, it, it seems like, they just should have let it breathe a little bit longer. Give us just a little bit more so we can kind of soak in some of this cool stuff because, I mean, those are big, gigantic plot lines, plot points that you want to spend a lot of time with. And when you're hopping between all of them so much, you, you want some time for that. So, but yeah, we're, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, we're moving into the third act and things are getting very interesting and juicy with this whole deal as clearly it's set up intrigue surrounding a bunch of different elements as to who knows what, what do they know, why don't they know things, There's so many questions. And we're at the point in time now where every episode you know big stuff is going to happen. The story's gonna progress in a major way and we're gonna have new details to kind of help us interpret things just a little bit differently. So um, as soon as it was over, I you know wished I kind of had a time machine or something. Oh, I wish I was like the twins and I could age myself up a week and watch next week's episode because they're they're just ratcheting up all the tension, all the stuff that makes you really, really want to see the next piece of the puzzle. From there, let's get into our episode walkthrough. This one kicks off with a very Malcolm in the middle style intro with the video cam footage, the unbelievably obnoxious theme song. Like I get that was the style of the time, but Man, this is an abrasive, abrasive song. Match the style properly, but that doesn't mean that it's pleasant. And then we get started with the episode and very much kind of follows that Malcolm in the Middle formula with the two twins kind of competing, talking directly to the camera. And then the other thing kind of thrown into the mix is Pietro in the family dynamic as the man child that's a ton of fun to be around, but not necessarily the best influence on a pair of kids and... As we learned from the title, this is the Halloween episode of the show, which the fact that this is a Halloween episode is very important as to where the last episode ended and what Vision was saying in his confusion, in his anger. He's like, where, where are all the other people in this city? Where are all the other people in the city? Next episode, Halloween episode. 
What happens on Halloween? Kids roam the streets out in public. So if someone, for, for example, is trying to get someone to stop having questions around why are, where are the children, Halloween would be a good way to be like, look, there they are right there. So anyway, we kind of move into our Halloween plot line. And there's this little anecdote where they start kind of recalling stories about their t- childhood, Wanda and Pietro. And it's kind of funny because it cuts to them trick-or-treating Sokovia and a lady gives them a fish, which is a very funny image to see. And then Wanda says, that's not how I remember it. Establishing this episode's episode's theme. And I think that's kind of what as we're far enough into this, you start to realize very quickly in the beginning dialogue of these episodes, they always set something up. They set up the theme of the episode really nicely in a way that feels exactly like the sitcoms of that time. It feels like the situation that you'd have in a sitcom, a brother and a sister, like, that's not how I remember what happened. And it makes total sense in the context of the sitcom, but it has really deep meaning for the overall story as a whole, as whatever is going on with all of this stuff. That's some of the fun brilliance of the show. There's just written with double meanings and everything. And we're far enough in that now whenever episode starts, you immediately go, I wonder what it is. I wonder what I'm looking for. What, what, what is it this time? That's a lot of fun. But so she says, that's not how I remember it. And Pietro says, probably suppressed childhood trauma. And he says it like he's joking around, like in a sitcom, but us as the audience, that like the ads for each of, in each of the episodes, tied to some trauma in her past, something that ties to her trauma in her past. The theme of even last week's episode was the sort of idea that you can't just run away from your pain. You can't just rewrite things to get control of your life when it feels like it's out of control. Set up really nicely. And then what does he describe as to why they have different childhood memories of their childhood? Suppressed childhood trauma, which is like what this show is all about. And it's played like a joke tied to this other stuff. There's some dialogue back and forth as Vision walks in. Obviously, each of them are dressed up like their classic comic book costumes. And so they're trying to come up with a funny punchline to that. So she says, I'm a Sokovian fortune teller. He says that I'm a luchador wrestler. It's a fun twist on it as us as the audience knows what's going on. Um, And that's the double meanings and everything that I think that's one of the things that this show just does really well, uh, as has been mentioned multiple times. And we're only in the opening scene of describing this episode. So then Vision basically says he wants to be on the neighborhood watch. He's going to look out for any troublemakers. Wanda is like, wait, I, that's not how this is supposed to go. For a second, it doesn't play it heavy like it has done many other times, so maybe this doesn't mean anything. But for a second, it has that vibe of when Wanda's not getting what she wants. Is that vibe of where in episodes one, two, three, she would have like just reset the timeline. She would have rewound things. And it, it, just a touch of that, not a ton of it. Just a little bit of the language that she said it that, wait, he's, he's not supposed to do that. He's supposed to be with us. And so with... Vision saying that he's going to go off and do the neighborhood watch. Pietro steps in and he goes, hey, I can be the father figure. I can do whatever he was going to do. And so then they head on out for the Halloween spooktacular festivities. So then we cut to the outside and kind of play catch up with what was going on with everyone. On the outside, Monica Darcy and Jimmy confront Hayworth over the fact that he, you know, sent in a drone missile to try and take out Wanda, which... They want to, like, talk her down, and he wants to blow her away. A little bit of a conflict between our forces on the outside. And he pretty openly says, like, you know, hey, we got to win this fight. She's a major threat. You saw what she did. She's kidnapped these people. We got to fix this right now. And they're like, no, we got to talk with her. We got to reason with her. We have to figure out why this is happening. Aren't you afraid of the consequences when you have this powerful person that can do all of this? What happens when you just blow her up? What, what does that do to the people on the inside, to the people on the outside? Kind of that back and forth. And then Hayworth like says this line of dialogue that seems looks like it might be really important for these Marvel Disney Plus shows where he's like really frustrated that Monica keeps advocating for super powered individuals. Like it's real distinct language where he's like, you keep advocating for super powered individuals. 
which I might not have picked up on that so much, but just last Sunday at the, the big game, we got a new trailer for Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And in that trailer, you have this line of dialogue from Baron Zemo being like, you know, superheroes, we don't need them anymore. We don't want them anymore. Superheroes cannot be allowed to exist. I don't remember exactly what it is. I'll try and remember to cut it in, to splice it right here into our little um, walkthrough. But that's two times in under seven days where we've had this little line of dialogue or little lines of dialogue about how people in the world really, really, really don't like superheroes anymore. That they view all of them as a threat. And that could mean a lot of different things. Right off the bat, people were very angry after the blip because you know they had to live in the apocalypse. And it was a superpowered person that did that. Superpowered person did all this stuff over the course of the MCU. But where other other place gets interesting, what is the basic worldview of the X Men, or the kind of broader metaphor of the X Men? It's all about bigotry and um, allegory, it's allegorical storytelling that came out of nineteen sixties in the civil rights movement about people looking down at another class of people that are different. Today, the downtown area was rocked by another outbreak of violence. The fact that the perpetrator is believed to be a mutant has fueled current anti-mutant hysteria now growing nationwide. And the MCU hasn't really done a lot in that direction. That's not the direction the MCU has gone, but it's huge to the X-Men who are now making their way into the MCU that they've been, Fox has been acquired a week ago, Quicksilver pops up from the Fox X-Men universe in the MCU. And then right here, in the last two times in the last five days, you have kind of this sort of idea of people with superpowers, bigotry towards them. They're a threat to us. We need to protect ourselves from those people with very harsh language. Not Thunderbolt Ross behavior from... Civil War that's like the government guy that's like, hey, we need to have make sure that we have control um, and we tell you guys when you can use your powers. This is outright. You're advocating for people with superpowers. I think this is another thing feels like we are laying the foundation. We are laying the groundwork for an X-Men movie or X-Men plot lines, mutants to show up and all of the classic plot lines of the X-Men showing up. And it's just, that's what's it's so cool with kind of the way these shows work is that like one line of dialogue can mean so much. I guess it's two lines of dialogue because we do have the trailer that I referenced before. But he says that. And as soon as he said it, I was like, is that where this is going? That that could mean really cool, cool, cool stuff right there if that's what that, that means. And um, there's a lot of hints that that's mutants, X-Men stuff set up is in this episode. So then he, he says, like, you keep advocating for superpowered individuals. And he's like, you know, I know, you know, Carol Danvers, you've got a history with her. And then he says, all you people who left us have the luxury of optimism. It's a great line. You have no idea what it was like, what it took to keep the lights on. And he just says like this thing is really nice and concise and immediately you can justify almost anything that he does at this point in time. And it like us as the audience, we we're rooting for our former Avengers that are in the bubble. We're rooting for our good intentioned FBI people. We're not rooting for the government bureaucrat guy. But as soon as he says that, you goes, right, right. He lived through the apocalypse. He, he lived through half of the people he knows dying as well as half the, the other life on the planet dying too. And how do you live in a world where half of the people disappeared? And we, we've only seen little glimpses of the chaos, or like little allusions to it in Far From Home and Endgame. But like that would be this Mad Max type scenario of chaos. And so he's the guy that was there. Even from episode four, the little dialogue between him and Monica, I, I was the only person that was left. Everyone disappeared and I was the only person that like, I, was, I was the only guy here. And it makes a lot more sense why this guy, he sees someone with powers. 
He lived through the trauma of the snap and Thanos. Monica, she was just sitting in a hospital and then woke up later in five years of trauma. She, she just skipped over it. So she has the optimism pre-snap, pre-blip, and he has all the trauma of it. Once again, how do you create a scenario where you have an X-Men level bigotry of people like superpowers or evil? You have half the population that lived through the apocalypse and half of them skipped it. You get two dramatically different worldviews that come out of that. That's interesting. That can be really cool to see where all of that goes. Anyway, Monica calls him a coward because he wants to blow her up. And she's like, no, we need to do the hard work of like actually trying to, to work with her. And then he says this line where you just, like, ooh, that was brutal. He goes, it's a good thing you weren't here. Uh, you're, it's a good thing you weren't here when your mother died. Clearly, you don't have the stomach for this job. And then Hayworth kicks them off the base. And so even the way the line said, you wonder like, what was the, was there more to it? More to the mother's death than maybe is implied? Is it something where he's hiding of something else kind of went on with that? Kind of got that impression just a little bit. And while they're under arrest and being walked out, Monica and Jimmy Woo take out their guards. It's fun to see Jimmy Woo. He seemed like a doofus in Ant-Man and the Wasp. I rewatched it just a few days ago. And he's a great comedic sidekick. He didn't realize that he's got a few more skills. But then again, since he had to have time to learn his little card trick, because you know Ant-Man and the Wasp took place right before... Infinity War, right parallel to Infinity War. It's tough to know exactly how much time passed between the main content of the movie and the post credit scene, but there wasn't a lot of time that passed there. And so he needed to be able to learn that card trick. And if he was snapped and just jumped forward, he didn't have time to do that. Uh, it was only, you know, who know, maybe a matter of months. And so he was really good at it. So it's probably he's been around for the last five years. But I'll, And if he did survive, that would explain why he's now a tough guy that needs to, to beat up. Uh, can beat up guards. So anyway, they they beat up some guards and they're going to go to work. Cut to us back inside of our sitcom. And Wanda and Pietro are talking and they're reminiscing about the past. And this met like, like a major theme. And you know, he, he turns to her and goes, are you testing me? All of this feeling like she's trying to figure out what is going on, why things are changed. He's trying to figure out what's going on. And... They start to acknowledge what the audience has been thinking all along. She's like, why do you look different? So people outside it, inside it, us, the audience are all like, he, he looks different. What, what, what's kind of going on here? And they don't know why. She doesn't know what's going on either, which kind of go into the bigger mysteries of all this. We've seen her be in control of so much in this episode. We talked about it. She's in control of so much. And then there's also so many mysteries as to what exactly is going on. And then he says... Hey, if I'd found Shangri-La, I wouldn't want to remember the past either. So, once again, to the memories, to trying to forget the past, moving all along. And something's going on with her, that her memory is gone. And that'll come back up later on. But she doesn't know what's going on. So there's some of, something else kind of uh, factoring into all of this. And he kind of walks off and uh, says, kick ass. And then she kind of pauses for a second and goes, kick ass. If you don't get the reference here, this is a really, really funny, clever little thing they did. Ten years ago, the movie Kick Ass came out. It stars uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson, who played her husband in Godzilla. And her brother, a year later in Age of Ultron, was the other Quicksilver. The friend of the lead character in Kick-Ass is played by this guy, Evan Peters. So the way the universe played out, a few years before all of these people were children of uh, Magneto, they, two of them were best friends in Kick-Ass, and then they ended up playing the same character in two different universes, and then two of them were husband and wife a year before they were, you know, became... Uh, I guess they wouldn't be called mutants. So it's just the funny the way that you know, the world of acting plays out. So they made a reference to the fact that they acted together in a movie. It's just a, f a really fun little joke to throw in there. But as I mentioned before, they're walking the streets of Halloween and suddenly you immediately see kids everywhere, which you haven't seen all along. Kind of going to Wanda recreated the reality for the purpose of being like, 
continuing to disguise. Okay, he's, he's nervous that it's not kids. Halloween, kids on the street. Boom. Makes that happen. And then you see Vision... Uh, or, or actually, we're not quite weren't uh, weren't quite there yet. So, kids are walking the street everywhere, and Herb is on duty. He's on actual security duty, safety duty, neighborhood watch duty, and he's hearing about people like stealing candy and stuff like that. And then you see Quicksilver running behind everyone, stealing the candy and misbehaving. So, just kind of playing into the sitcom vibe of, of, of he's mischievous and a bad influence on the kids. And then he turns to Wanda and he goes, do you want something changed? As if he's just like serving her. And, and it he says it dead face. He doesn't say it like he's snapping out of it. He says it like Vision's not there. And so then he doesn't need to keep pretending. He can say like, hey, do you need something changed? Much like with what happened last week, but Vision was standing right there. And so you can see kind of the rules of the universe kind of keep shifting. And it's making many more overt references to they're trying to serve her and do what she wants. But he says, Vision's not on the neighborhood watch. And you go, oh, Vision wanted to do something else. Cut to Vision. He's walking down the streets and he's going further and further. He wants to get away from Wanda and he wants to get away from, away from the town core. And as he's walking down the streets, he, he looks at this house and there's a lady like hanging decorations. And she's just doing this. And behind her, you see her husband just like picking up a pumpkin and putting it down. Picking up the pumpkin and putting it down. And then a tear just starts going down the lady's face. And you're like, Whoa, that's so subtle, but so horrifying at the exact same time. And so Vision clearly is he's trying to figure out what is this. Then we get our ad and it's uh, the most disturbing one yet. <laughs> you have a kid stuck on an island without any food and trapped there, which... Metaphor, analogy for the show that we're watching. People stuck in this island that is the reality and their souls are suffering. We go straight from this lady, like on the space, just in agony to kid in agony on the island. And shark pops out of the water and offers him a cup of yo magic or uh, uh, yeah, yo magic yogurt and hands him the little cup. Like, here you go, kid. Just have to pop the top and you can... Get everything you need. And then it does like this fast motion of the kid, like <laughs> nervously trying to open it and can't get it open and it decays into a skeleton. And it's like really disturbing because the previous ones of these ads referenced her past trauma, but it referenced in a way to where um, a problem was solved. Whereas here, the person was given the solution, but they're, he's stuck. There is no escape. Theme of this episode. There's no escape in anything that seems like help. It's not really, you can't get to it. And the person just decays away right there in front of you. Foreshadowing what's to come. And so it seemed like this ad might mark a transition in the focus of these. Because it seems like the first set were based off her traumas. And I wonder if these next ones are going to be from perspective of the people in the town. Of analogies, metaphors for the suffering that they're facing right now because of Wanda. Back inside of the town, Wanda and Pietro continue to talk. And he's like, hey, I'm just trying to do my part. Reference, like, and it seems like it's referencing trying to serve her on whatever she's doing with this city. He's, they're not really talking about the plot of the episode. They're talking about this city thing. And she realized like, hey, what happened to your accent? He's like, what happened to your accent? Which is an ongoing joke about Wanda that she had this very thick, obvious accent in Age of Ultron, and then it very suddenly disappeared out of the blue. And then as we're watching last week's episode, no accent, no accent in the series, she walks outside the field, confronts the guys, a little bit of accent comes back. And so the show itself is starting to like, this a the question that has plagued a thousand YouTubers why did her accent disappear? We start exploring it once again. Pietro responds, what happened to yours? Details are fuzzy. So what? recurring theme, recurring theme, recurring theme. They don't really understand, remember what happened. They're trying to piece it together themselves. Because one minute I was shot in the street and the next I hear you calling. So you're trying to piece together like, okay, so he has those memories of... MCU guy dying. 
But at the other times, they're saying details are fuzzy. I remembered that differently. So we don't know exactly how these pieces kind of fit together. He says, you know, next minute, I hear you calling me. And so then, you know, she summoned him to this world, whatever that means, whatever that looks like. And if that means in this world, the memories are of him dying, but she couldn't summon an actual dead human. So she had to pluck him from somewhere, which was Fox universe. Is that what it means that like she was just trying to do this and kind of converge these two things together so that he could appear there to help? Seems what seems something like that. The kids walk up. One of them has super speed and he's stealing candy and they realize, oh, they've got superpowers. And, you know, he's, hey, chip off the old Maximoff block because quick, the Quicksilver dressed twin is running super fast like Quicksilver himself. So we realize they they have powers. We know one of their powers and we're soon going to get the other ones. And they're like, hey, can we go get candy? She says, don't go past Ellis Street. I don't think that has deep meaning to it, but it's it's important for what happens in just a moment. I uh, did just a little search because any times they, they pick a name, normally there's some con connection to it. I did a Google search. Warren Ellis is an X-Men writer. Um, I don't know if there's anything deeper about the name Ellis, but there is an X-Men writer named Warren Ellis. So I don't, like I said, don't know if that means anything. There's a minor connection to Ellis in just a second. Cut to the outside. Just a quick little scene. Monica um, sees Quicksilver for the first time. She's like, who's that guy? And they're like, yeah, he got a facelift. They changed him whenever all the stuff happened. And basically, Monica, Darcy, and Jimmy are hacking into the system. They realize that, hey, we're just tracking Vision. And Vision is walking towards the outskirts of the city. And they realize kind of like they're tracking the vitals of all the people that are on the inside and they realize the people on on the outskirts they're not even moving they're just like standing still stuck in this world and on that note it cuts to vision walking to the outskirts so we see exactly what they were viewing on the monitor and there's just all these people standing still kind of walks up to a lady starts talking to her and she just doesn't respond and so he's like okay I, no more charade, pfft, takes off the luchador costume, flies up into the sky to like, what can I see? And he looks out and he sees a, a car at an intersection. So he, that's just stopped there, not moving. So he flies over to it. It's the intersection of Ellis Street and uh, Rolling Hill at Ellis Street that she had just mentioned. So that's where she stopped. So he flies over. It's Agnes sitting in her car, just kind of like, not doing anything. He starts trying to talk to her and she kind of mumbles things, but in kind of incoherent answers. She doesn't know why she's there, what she's doing. So he does his little boop mind trick. She snaps out of it and she's like really afraid because she sees vision. She's like, you, you, what are you, you, what are you, why are you here? Like, uh, you're an Avenger. Can you help us? He's like, yes, I can help you. But what's an Avenger? She's like, why don't, like, what, why don't I understand? Why don't you know who you are? And, and she's like, oh no, oh no. And we get this clip that was in the trailer. Am I dead? No. Why would you think that? Because you are. So up to this point in time, I've, in these videos I've been saying, I thought Agnes probably was up to something because we'd seen this little clip where she'd said that. She'd been acting fishy and funny. So I thought maybe that was heading towards that path. This seems to indicate that she's just another victim. And even like when they put up the pictures on the wall, they identified all these people. They hadn't identified her. And last week, she was the one that kind of snapped out. It was like, is, what, do you want me to redo that? But then we saw a lot of people do that this week. So it seems like some of the evidence that was pointing towards her, maybe she's a red herring. Maybe that she was intended to kind of like send us down a path thinking there was something there. But then that's not, not really the right place to be looking. Could be. Maybe she's tricking them right now. But it seemed from this scene that she's truly, truly traumatized and very confused about all this. But anyway, Vision tells her like, hey, I'm going to get out of this town and I'm going to get help. And she's like, how? Like, Wanda won't even let us think about leaving. And so when you start being like, okay, Wanda is controlling their actions. And then she's also blocking out their thoughts. Like, you can't even think about that. That level um, of control. And so then she starts like losing it and cackling. <laughs> so he boop, snaps her back into it and she turns around at Ellis Street, drives back into town and you see Vision 
walk past Ellis Street, the boundary that she, that Wanda said, don't go past Ellis Street. So he goes past it. It's the intersection of Ellis and Rolling Hill. Once again, I did a quick little Google search on that to see like what, what could that possibly mean? And apparently that's the actual shooting location. Like if you're in at the Atlanta, Georgia area, just look up Rolling Hill. And I guess you could find this neighborhood where they shot the show. Um, and maybe Ellis Street is too. Maybe Ellis Street is literally just the street there. And there's no connection to the Warren Ellis that I mentioned before. But his name popped up in a Google search. So thought I would mention it just in case maybe some of you can give me some insight. Back to the outside and... Darcy hacks into Monica's medical files as she's kind of hacking through all the stuff you see on her computer. And Monica gets a phone call saying from someone, we don't know who it is. And she says, all right, my guy's got me my stuff so I can get back into the hex. Question mark, who's the guy on the phone? Who's she talking to? Is it someone important or is it just literally her guy? Like, is it is it a guy that's going to give her some tech or is that a cameo that's going to be a lot of fun to see whoever she meets up with? I would think that would be a setup for just some familiar face to return but um, who knows what exactly that could be. But her and Jimmy are about preparing to leave to go get something down the road on the other side of the ridge to allow her, Monica, to go back into the hex. Darcy immediately goes, no, 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 no. You can't go back in there. And Monica says, what are you talking about? Worst case scenario, you know, uh, I lose my free will and I get some ugly pants or something like that. <laughs> so Darcy's like, no, 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 no. So you cross the boundary two different times and she says, like, you're... Body has been rewritten at the molecular level. You are changing. Once again, I'm trying to think, where is all of this going? How does it set up phase four? Because this is our kickoff to phase four. And, you know, clearly we're heading towards multiverse. We have Doctor Strange 2 and the multiverse of madness. Every rumor we've heard about Spider-Man 3, it's multiverse. So we're trying to figure out how, how does all this tie together? What does all of this mean? And obviously they've acquired the X-Men. And so you create that you have this moment now where it's like, if you pass through this deal, you're rewritten at the molecular level. You're changed at the molecular level. So you're trying to think, how do you create, introduce a way that in this universe that has, doesn't seem to have had mutants up to this point in time, do something where they're on a large scale level, there's mutants. Well, they just introduced a plot line where people are being rewritten at the molecular level and as we'll see, Wanda's expanding this thing. So if Wanda goes full-blown crazy and does something, expands this thing even bigger to the world, tries to rewrite all of reality so that no one can kind of stop her, you create a scenario where a lot of people are rewritten and maybe there's some set of rules of certain genetic codes, certain people that you've got blipped, it starts messing with you a little bit and suddenly you have a mechanism by which you introduce mutants into the world of the MCU that feels like a nice logical continuation of the plot being established here and with ties to my understanding, some ties to some comic book stuff that's happening. But Monica's not worried about this. She's like, no, I've, I've felt her pain. I got to go help her. I got to do what I can do. And Darcy's like, I got to stay here. I got to keep hacking. Hayward's up to something. I need to know what he's doing. So I'm, I'm not leaving. So, once again, there's a lot of things in this episode that just hint at potential setup for X-Men, mutants, big implications. And that's where the show starts getting interesting because on the one hand, we're watching these kind of simple little sitcom episodes with a little bit of X-Files mystery to it. And on the other hand, like this could be change the whole trajectory of the biggest franchise on the planet. And it's all little lines of dialogue. It's all Hayworth saying, you've shown a lot of sympathy for superpowered individuals. It's a simple line of dialogue. You're being rewritten by crossing through this field. And you go, wait, what does that mean? That could be absolutely huge. Back to Wanda and Pietro. And their conversation continues to be not really about the sitcom stuff. And so they muse for a little bit about, you know, how their mom and dad would re respond to some of the stuff setting up like, wait, in the X-Men movies, his dad is Michael Fossbender. And the old version of him is, um, Gandalf. We've been told through, I mean, so, so there's the whole quote last week that Elizabeth Olsen said that there's a Luke Skywalker sized cameo, coming 
And it was, it was really the way the question was phrased. Like, is there a Luke Skywalker size cameo? And she's like, oh, yeah, there's some really cool stuff I can't wait for people to see. Evan Peters wouldn't be that. He's not Luke Skywalker size, but it has implications for the universe that are huge. But you start to play this out and you have Magneto showing up as, as Wanda's dad. Michael Fassbender, however that plays out. That's pretty cool. <laughs> there's some there's some cool stuff that you could do if you decided to head down that path that would make a lot of sense if you're trying if you're trying to what has this like <clears throat> mind blowing like they just did that moment. Michael Fassbender, Gandalf showing up. That's pretty cool if you're able to head down that path and scenes that have a lot of emotional resonance. Because you're trying to think, like, what's a, a moment that would be powerful? This version of Wanda, her parents are, de are dead, and that kind of defines her. So you have her dad show up. That, that tugs at the heartstrings in a really big way. So that could be really interesting if, if they head down that path. So then you have, uh, Petra says, so where are you hiding all... Uh, uh, where have you been hiding all these kids until now? And she's like, what? And so then the episode itself calls attention to the fact that kids suddenly appeared everywhere. And he starts joking around like, right, right. Yeah, you only show up, have the kids show up for a cameo in the Halloween episode. That's smart. Don't traumatize them too much. Uh, I, I get it. Like you're playing the moral implications of all this really nicely. And he starts like talking about the ethics of everything. And you start to realize that he, perhaps the reason he was called in is because she needs either someone on her shoulder to help her process through the implications of what she's doing or someone on her shoulder to talk her into what she's doing. Because it can kind of go either way. Having the person bring all this stuff up that makes you go, wait, what am I doing? Or is it the person that's like, hey... You're handling this great. Yeah, this is a good idea. Good job with all of this. And so she's like, wait, wait, how, wait are, are you mad at me? You think this is a good idea? Like she starts being the one being like, you think this is a good idea? He's like, yeah, I'm impressed. I mean, you went from just kind of putting dreams in people's heads and making balls of electricity to like creating a reality and kind of acknowledging what the audience has been thinking. Now it's been set on the show inside of the show, inside of the show, not just people outside, but people inside is saying it to her of like, how are you doing all this? What, what is kind of going on here? And he says, he says that. How did you even do all of this? And she doesn't know. Like, and she says, I don't know how I did it. I only remember completely feeling alone, empty. I just, endless nothingness. So you have that moment where she doesn't even know how this is happening. She's controlling it. She's changing things. She's protecting it but she doesn't know why it's happening. She doesn't know what she's doing. And she's like having this moving pondering in her darkness and then cuts over to Pietro and he's dead, covered in bullet holes. And just like, just like they did with Vision a couple episodes back where she starts kind of like being introspective and thinking about her past trauma, cut to him and he's dead. <sighs> and it's just like, whoa, oh, whoa. That just happened. That was like right there in our face. Cut to the outside. Darcy discovers what Hayworth is up to, but doesn't say it. So she says something that makes the audience go, wait, what does she know? We want to know. And she opens up her email and the audience learns something important. Jimmy Woo's email address. So she writes him an email to tell him whatever this information is. But like I said, for the audience, we now have Jimmy Woo's email address. So if you want to know, learn how to do the magic card trick or close-up magic, you can actually watch this episode, learn his email, and ask him how to do all of that. It cuts to Hayworth, and basically he sees Vision moving towards the barrier, and they say, hey, let's, we got to go stop this. So they start heading out, and we kind of move into our final section of the episode where Vision approaches the barrier... And he just goes for it, like sees it, this thing, and he just starts just forcing himself through it. And it's, it's like, clearly this is painful. It's, he's exerting a lot of effort to get through it. And Hayworth even says he really does want out, doesn't he? Which 
I guess you could read that a couple of ways if it's just he's observing, oh, that guy's stuck in there. He really does want out. Or there's this other sense to like if Hayworth ties into the plot line somehow, there's something involved, like he had some involvement in all of this. He's in trying to keep Vision captive. He's afraid of Vision. So then this little bubble was supposed to keep this big threat captive. There could be this other interpretation of what all exactly Hayworth meant by that. But Hayworth says he really wants out, doesn't he? Uh, which could be the setup for something. And Darcy sees all this. She runs over. She's not very smart. She's just screaming, help him, help him, help him, around the agents that are under Hayworth's control. And so she gets arrested and handcuffed up to a vehicle. So she can't help too much. And, like, we, we see Vision, like, pull himself all the way through. And the further he gets, the more it's tugging him back to the degree that it starts tearing him apart as he's, like, scratching and crawling, like, screaming, help these people. The people need help. The people need help. And so even though, like, he's not even able to do anything to help the people, all he can do is just scream to help the people on the inside, even though he's actively, be, like, literally torn apart in this horrifying fashion. Cut to the inside, and our other twin apparently is telepathy, and he's, like, sensing all of this stuff. So he walks up to his mother like, dad's in trouble. Like, you got to go help Vision. Like, you you have to help him. He He's he's in danger. Something is happening. Like, I, 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 you have to help him. Um, And then Pietro says, don't, and he's, he's, he's being torn apart. Pietro says, don't sweat it. It's not like your dead husband can die twice. So he says that, Vision is dead in front of the kids. So she's not happy about this. Wanda makes a blast bolt and like blasts him, shoots him backwards. Anyone that challenges this reality, she's threatened by. Even her brother, her dead brother, that her soul was torn out that her brother died. And then she just blasted him for pointing out that Vision was dead in a joking manner. And then as soon as she blasts him and like, Asks the kid, where's, where's dad? Where's dad? Where's dad? And he says something. And then she like freezes everybody. And you just see this bolt of energy or whatever kind of move away from her. And the field starts to expand. And you start seeing this setup for the future, uh, the rest of the season. So down, Jimmy and Monica are already down the road because they were going to go get this device. So there's a plot reason why they are very safe from all of this. Hayworth and his crew are like, uh-oh, we better get out of here. Hayworth being the smart one of the bunch, immediately jumps into the vehicle, starts jetting out of there. Darcy is handcuffed to a car, and so she's like, oh, fudge, and she gets sucked into it. So in the future, she's going to be, next week's episode, she should be in the sitcom, in that world, I, I suppose. And as we learned, that means she's being rewritten at a molecular level because of all this. So maybe she's going to have mutant powers or superpowers in the near future because of whatever happens. So Hayworth speeds down the road and his car's barely kind of getting past it. And anytime the barrier crosses over something, it rewrites it to fit into the sitcom world. So Vision is healed to look properly. Tents for FBI stuff or sword stuff turn into carnival things. Cars turn into hot air balloons. And Hayworth manages to escape. So... Jimmy and Monica have escaped. Hayworth and a couple people have escaped. And everybody else just got sucked into this deal. And it's now this huge, huge bubble. Cut to Wanda's face and her eyes are just glowing red. <laughs> Credits roll. So what to make of all of this? There's several big questions that are kind of lingering of how is Wanda doing all of this? Why doesn't she remember and is there some other force tying into this? What is Hayworth up to? And then some of the smaller ones. What is Monica getting down the road? Who is she meeting up with? Why is Pietro different? A lot of these questions. But of course, the big one, where is all of this going? There have already been major implications for the MCU. And we've got three episodes left. And it seems like each episode is introducing a bigger and bigger reveal with more important implications for the MCU as a whole. So, man, what happens in the third act? And as much as the episodes one, two, and three was kind of like, okay, that was a sitcom with no implications, no no context or anything. 
These ones are the opposite of like every line of dialogue. You're like, wait, what does that mean for the MCU as a whole? Wait, how does that, doesn't that mean this? What is, is this where this is headed? And it like, oh, like pendulum swings from like no context implications to, whoa, that was huge. What does that mean? Where is this going? So it's kind of kind of fun and interesting. Um, I think like at the beginning I said, I wish they dropped the whole show in, in one little bit because this with the way this is working, I don't know if people have patience for it. And these ones are the other side to it of they give you an episode with a plot. You have the sitcom stuff, you have the outside stuff, and then you have some big cliffhanger at the end that makes you go, whoa, what now? That certainly hooks people and could get them to cut you may, like all week long. You're like, man, I can't wait till next week. Uh, Thursday, I better rewatch the episode. So I'm all cut up for next week's episode. So um, th this show is very much winning me over with where it's taking things and the way they're explaining stuff and um, pr pretty cool. So anyway, I, I can't wait till next week's episode to see how it all ties together. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section. But uh, this is... It's getting exciting for the MCU as a whole. See you next week.